Good evening. My name is Karen Seidman. I am the Special Needs Coordinator for Cuyahoga County Board of Health. You are today at the seventh session of our Functional Needs Program. Today our topic is going to be about diabetes, and I'm so the goal, as usual, is to plan and operate emergency shelters and points of dispensing, otherwise known as pods, in Northeast Ohio, responsive to the needs of all community members. I'm going to let Marianne, our presenter, tell you about what the objectives are, because I think that's in your presentation, Marianne. Um, so let me introduce Marianne. This is Marianne Nikolai, and she is a registered dietetic technician, and she has worked with the Diabetes Partnership of Cleveland for over 20 years. She's responsible for developing and implementing diabetes education materials and activities in diverse and underserved communities. Such, and some of the things that she has done include the African American Family Reunion Program, best practices in blood glucose monitoring for allied health professionals, and DIVA coaching sessions for women touched by diabetes. She is the lead staff member um, on a recently received health literacy grant, and some of the things that she's done is visited um, places for looking at best practices, facilitated focus groups and literature revisions, developed the diabetes survival skills presentations, and she has written the curriculum for, presented, and facilitates the Diabetes Ambassador Volunteer Program. So please welcome Marianne. And what we'd like to do, or what I would like to do, is um, before you can help people with diabetes, you have to have a little bit of an understanding about what it is. So we're going to talk about basic diabetes management tonight. And then we're going to take that basic diabetes management and apply it to emergency situations. And then we're also going to use some tools that we've developed to help you determine what kind of assistance somebody with diabetes might need in regard to medications and self-blood glucose monitoring, and that's what SBGM is, self-blood glucose monitoring. So that's kind of our goal for tonight. Have some of you worked with people with diabetes in emergency shelters or situations like that? Okay, so some of you, a couple of you have some experience. So I, I think I may look to you tonight to tell me kind of what happened, and then we'll see how, how, how did you do, what did you do, is there something that we could have done different, or what issues did you have surrounding that? I have never been in an emergency situation until Hurricane Sandy came through Cleveland. Um, I guess that touched us a little bit last year, and I was without power for seven days, and it was not pleasant. I, I, I didn't like one day of it. And aside from losing a lot of trees, big, beautiful old trees in my yard, it was just seven days of unpleasantness. So I may relate some of that to kind of my experiences with emergency situations. But let's start at the beginning, the very beginning. As I go along, if you have questions, please go ahead and ask. If it's something that we're going to get to, I'll tell you just to hang on, we'll get to that. Otherwise, I'll make sure that we answer your questions at some point during the presentation. First order of business is to just kind of talk about what is diabetes. Diabetes is a chronic illness. That means once you have it, it's yours to keep. There's no cure for diabetes. It doesn't go away. Once you have it, it's yours to keep. Diabetes is an illness that affects the way your body uses the food that you eat for energy. Now, either for people that have diabetes, either your body is not making any insulin or the insulin that it does make is not being used the right way. Your body isn't making enough or your body isn't using it the right way. So either way, you know, that, that's kind of what diabetes is. Diabetes is diagnosed through a blood test. That's the only way we know. And usually people are tested for diabetes after the age of 45, unless you have symptoms, and then you might be tested a little bit more often. It's usually every year after the age of 45. These are some basic risk factors for developing um, diabetes. Type 1, or, well, these are more type 2 diabetes, actually. Being over the age of 45, having blood relatives with diabetes, being overweight, being a person of color, um, not exercising, being a little bit more sedentary, having high cholesterol or heart disease, having high blood pressure, having had diabetes while you were pregnant, and that's for, obviously for ladies, it's called gestational diabetes, and then having a baby that weighs over 9 pounds at birth. These are all risk factors for developing diabetes. These are some symptoms of diabetes. 
Now, these can be symptoms for type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Having an increased hunger, being very thirsty, and not the kind of thirst on a hot day, but a thirst that you just can't quench. You are drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. Um, frequent urination, your blood sugar levels are rising high. Your body is trying to flush that high blood sugar out of your um, system through your urine. Being very tired, when blood sugar levels are high, it really take, uh, can zap your energy. Slow healing wounds, that has to do with circulation. Changes in your vision. Tingling, numbness um, in your hands and feet. We tend to see that more in the feet and in the legs and in the hands. Um, unexplained weight loss. We tend to see unexplained weight loss more in type 1 diabetes than in type 2 diabetes. But these are all symptoms of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Generally with type 1 diabetes, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is um, in a minute, generally with type 1 diabetes, you know something's wrong. Something is not right. The symptoms are very pronounced. A lot of times it's like a flu-type symptom or a flu-type feeling that just doesn't go away. With type 2 diabetes, these symptoms, if you have them, can be very subtle. You can easily attribute them to something else. If you're having changes in your vision, well, as we get over, older, our vision changes. So we can attribute that to just old age or um, slow healing wounds or being hungry. We, we can always attribute it to something else. So these symptoms in type 2 tend to be a little bit more subtle. There are three different types of diabetes that we're going to talk about today. Type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and then gestational diabetes. Type 1 diabetes used to be known as juvenile onset diabetes. This is a type of diabetes that tends to develop before the age of 30, um, usually in children, although it can develop at any time. In type 1 diabetes, your body is no longer producing insulin. The cells in your pancreas that produce insulin have been destroyed. So your body does not produce insulin any longer. Folks with type 1 diabetes need to take insulin to survive. Without it, they will not survive. Insulin um, can be injected through um, a syringe and a vial in a syringe, through insulin pens or through insulin pumps. Whatever the mechanism, people with type 1 diabetes need to take insulin, as well as eat healthy and get up and move. Type 2 diabetes is the most common type of diabetes. This type of diabetes, probably 90 to 95% of all people with diabetes have type 2 diabetes. Tends to develop as we get older. Um, usually after the age of 45 is when we tend to see it most. However, we are seeing younger and younger people developing type 2 diabetes. We're seeing type 2 diabetes develop in children, grade school children. And the problem with this, with this is that it used to be a disease of old age, and now we're seeing it younger and younger. Um, people with type 2 diabetes can manage their blood sugar through healthy eating, getting up and moving, maybe taking medication if they need it oral medication, or insulin. In type 2 diabetes, your body is still making some insulin. It's just not using it the right way or it's not making enough of it. The third type of diabetes we're going to talk about is gestational diabetes. This type of diabetes develops in women during pregnancy. It's the only type of diabetes that tends to go away. Usually, after, mom, uh, after the baby is born, mom's blood sugar will normalize. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it doesn't go away. If a woman has gestational diabetes, she has a 50% chance of developing type 2 diabetes within about 6 to 10 years after um, having had gestational diabetes. So it's a, a big risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes later in life. Now, this is how we manage diabetes, regardless of what kind of diabetes you have, type 1, type 2, or gestational diabetes. We manage diabetes with healthy food choices by checking your blood sugar level, by being physically active, getting up and moving, and by taking diabetes medications if you need to. Okay. Uh, next slide, I'm on healthy food choices now. So we're going to take a look at each one of those a little bit, and then we're going to kind of relate it to emergency situations. Healthy food choices when it comes to managing diabetes, the thing to know is that there is no diabetic diet. How many of you were raised with like a 1,500, 1,800 calorie diabetic diet on? Gone a long time ago. We don't do that anymore. Um, there is no diabetic diet. A person with diabetes can eat anything I can eat, for the most part, 99% of all the foods out there. We can eat anything I can eat. We just need to look at it a little bit differently. Our general guidelines for nutrition and diabetes are to eat three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, to eat about the same time each day, and to eat about the same amount of food at each meal. So we're kind of setting ourselves up on a little bit of a schedule or a routine. 
Um, we don't want to skip meals because we're trying to mimic what our pancreas would normally do. So skipping meals is going to make it hard for our pancreas to, um, to function the way we want it to. Uh, we want to watch the fat. People with diabetes are more likely to have heart disease. So it just makes sense that we follow a more low-fat diet. Anybody living in the United States is more likely to have heart disease. So it just makes sense that we follow a more low-fat diet. We want to watch the portion size. Again, 99% of the foods out there are going to fit into a meal plan that somebody with diabetes could follow or could eat. But we want to watch portion sizes. And we want to learn how to read and use food labels so that we can make some healthy food choices. How many of you read food labels and use them? All the time, sometime, a little bit of time? Okay, now, relating this to emergency situations. People with diabetes that are coming into emergency shelters or needing assistance with housing or whatever their emergency needs might be, this is where you're coming in, we want to have something to eat every four to five hours, some kind of food every four to five hours. We'd like to provide some type of between-meal snacks. Um, and again, these are not meals, they're just snacks. We want to make sure that we get carbohydrates at each meal. Carbohydrates are fruits. They're starches or grains or vegetables. They're milk. They're yogurt. These are all carbohydrate foods. Carbohydrates are the component of food that breaks down into um, energy or glucose. That's our body's um, source of energy. So we need to have about 50% of calories coming from carbohydrates. Now, um, we want them coming from good sources of carbohydrates. An apple is always going to be a better source of carbohydrate than a cookie, but both of them are sources of carbohydrates. So we want them to be coming from good, healthier choices. Serving sugar-free beverages or having sugar-free beverages available at the shelters or wherever you are is a good thing for people that are looking at and watching their weight, but also um, watching their blood sugar levels. And then we want to serve the foods or whatever foods that we're serving to people. We want to try to make them as heart healthy as we can. The question was, if you skip meals, that your liver is going to dump some uh, stored glucose or glycogen into the system. What we want to make sure that we're doing is, or sometimes people think that if you skip a meal, because I haven't eaten anything, it won't affect my blood sugar because food affects blood sugar. But you have to remember that that little mechanism within your body that helps to keep your blood sugar in good control is broken. That little switch is not working any longer. So we think, or it makes sense to us, that if we don't eat something, that our blood sugar won't be affected. But actually, if our blood sugar dips too low, then our body is going to spit something out to help it not go down too low. But it doesn't just spit out. It, it spits out whatever it wants. It's not always regulated how much it's going to spit out. So the blood sugar level could go up. It could go down also. It's just the nature of diabetes. That little mechanism to keep it within a normal level is not working any longer. And we're looking at some meal ideas. We'll look at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then we'll look at some snack ideas, and then we'll look at some beverage ideas. Now, tell me, what kind of foods would you serve in emergency shelters? So those of you that have worked with people that have diabetes, what did you do for them when it came to food? We, uh, for being hypoglycemic, uh, we had lunches readily available. Uh, we also had some uh, sugar cubes available, too. So you had sugar cubes and orange juice for people that had hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Okay. And then if they were uh, hyper, we had uh, the Red Cross card in their system. So if they had high blood sugar or hyperglycemia, you had a nurse available to help them. Do you know what the nurse did to help them? Uh, most people that would come into the shelter, if they had a medical problem on their hands, they, they fill out a medical form. Okay. The nurse has available to treat. Okay. Okay. So the nurse... Just take that from there. Okay. Anybody else? What kind of things did you do or do you do for folks that have diabetes? Treating for shock. For treating for shock. Okay. Yes. Milkshakes. Milkshakes? Okay. Did you make them up or go out to McDonald's? No, they had them in the car. Okay. And that was for meal replacement or snacks or? Hypoglycemia. Okay, so that's a few years back, Andrew. Yeah. So refrigeration for medication, food, by the grace of God, whatever came through the door. Well, let's look at this. We've got some meal ideas here. If you were in a situation where you needed to provide meals for somebody with diabetes. Now, again, there aren't a whole lot of foods that somebody with diabetes can't eat. Maybe they haven't eaten it or it's not something that they're used to eating. But there isn't a whole lot somebody with diabetes cannot eat. Any kind of cold cereal with milk would be fine. 
there are always some cereals that are going to be better choices, but when you're in a situation where it's an emergency and you're taking what you have, any kind of cereal works well. It's the amount more than anything else. Milk is going to be, a, a low-fat milk is going to be a better choice, but again, whatever comes through the door is going to be fine too. So cereal and milk would be fine for breakfast. Toast, yogurt, fruit. Um, I have yogurt up there again, so it's really good, I guess. Bagels with cream cheese. Foods that you would have for breakfast. If you were going, you know, you're getting your food from McDonald's, there are Egg McMuffins or um, oatmeal at McDonald's that could fit into a meal plan. Would it be the best choice? Maybe not always, but in an emergency situation, everything will fit. We're trying to, again, make sure that we get in enough carbohydrate. We want to get in about 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per meal. That's where reading the food label comes in. No, 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per meal is what's recommended by the American Dietetic Association, the American Diabetes Association, and the American Association of Diabetes Educators. Now, if you have worked out a meal plan with a dietitian that is specific to your needs, then you go with that. But general guidelines for people with diabetes, according to those three governing agencies, is 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per meal. For men, it could go up as high as 70 grams of carbohydrate per meal, depending on your needs and your activity level. Snacks, we want to keep under 20 grams of carbohydrate. I know that you don't believe me, and that's okay, but I'm going on um, American Association of Diabetes Educators, the American Diabetes Association, the American College of Endocrinology, so I'm going by evidence-based science. And these are general guidelines that will work well for people until they get in to see a dietitian. So keeping that in mind, when you're planning meals, if you're reading food labels, between 45 and 60 grams. Lunchtime, lunch meat sandwiches would be fine. A deli meat sandwich if you were at Subway. A healthy Subway sandwich, small six-inch sandwich would be fine. Soup, salad, fruit. A grilled chicken salad from McDonald's could work out fine also. Rolls and crackers, fruit. We're getting in some carbohydrates there. We're getting in some protein. We're getting in some fat, depending on where you're coming from with your meals. But we're getting in some good things. Something like this would be fine. Dinner time, baked chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, roll with butter, fruit. Again, think about the my plate, which is what we're using now to guide our choices at meals. If you think of a plate, half of the plate with vegetables, of the other half, you divide that in half. So a quarter of your plate would be starches, and a quarter of your plate would be protein. So if you set a dinner plate up like that, or a lunch plate up like that, you're providing people with what they need to take care of themselves. Um, snack times, usually between meal snacks are fine. Not everybody needs between meal snacks or eats between meal snacks. But if it's a snack for somebody with diabetes, we want to keep it, again, to about 20 grams of carbs or less. That can be accomplished through a piece of medium-sized fruit, about the size of a tennis ball, um, any kind of fruit. Any kind of fruit is fine. The 100-calorie snack packs are fine. Graham crackers, peanut butter with crackers, yogurt, again, sandwiches, just a whole host of different ideas. Ice cream is fine. A dish of ice cream. Pudding is fine. It doesn't have to be sugar-free pudding. Um, the pudding in a carton that you can get um, ready to use is fine. It's going to have the um, carb requirement that is okay. Um, cheese with fruit, pretzels, cottage cheese. These are all good snacks, something easy to have, something um, that is wrapped perhaps might, be, might work easier. Are these any kind of snacks that you've had at shelters, or what have you had for people? The little square crackers? The, yeah. Okay. And that works fine. It's not the best choice, but in a situation like this, it can work just fine. Can fit in there just fine. What else did you have? Um, we also had fruit uh, and mm -hmm. fresh fruit. Fresh fruit. Mm -hmm. so fruit. Okay. Yeah, fruit, bananas, oranges. It doesn't matter what. The army army meals to eat. Okay. And that's 2,000 calories and 1,500 carbs per package. And we were issuing them three per day per person. 1,500 carbs or 150. 1,500 carbs because per pack? Yeah, okay. And more research for soldiers in the field. Yeah. Under extreme physical conditions. Yeah, okay. But what happened there is the people were eating three of them a day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, if it had that many carbs in it for somebody that was perhaps taking medication, you have to balance the medication with the carbs or meet them and 
Yeah, that might be a little difficult to do. See, we're going to turn to beverages now. Uh, beverages idea, uh, beverage ideas for people with diabetes. Um, milk is fine. Lower fat milk is, is always going to be a better choice for really anybody over the age of two. Any kind of sugar-free beverage is good, whether it's sugar-free soda or um, coffee, tea uh, with sugar substitutes. Water is always your best, your always best bet. Um, crystal light or sugar-free type beverages. Fruit, um, fruit juice is okay in small amounts, but a serving of fruit juice is four ounces or a half a cup, and that is like a swallow for most of us. So if you're serving a glass of fruit juice, and you have a glass like the size that you have your water in today, that's going to be a lot of carbs and a lot of calories. And um, it's not something that you want to be sipping on during the day. For instance, four ounces of juice can raise somebody's blood sugar 35 to 50 points. So if you had a glass like that, which is probably about 12 to 16 ounces, think how high that could raise somebody's blood sugar if they're sipping on that or drinking that as a beverage. So we kind of want to stay away from that as best possible. If you're serving some or you're taking what you get or taking what is brought to the, you know, brought through your doors, water is always going to be the best choice in that case because you don't want to do something that's going to really drastically raise somebody's blood sugar. So I would really be careful about that. Now, one of the other approaches to helping to manage blood sugar levels is physical activity. Um, we know that getting up and moving is going to lower your blood sugar level. It also lowers your blood pressure. It lowers your cholesterol. It helps you sleep. It enhances your mood. It just does a host of wonderful things for us, but we just aren't really able. Some of us just don't do it, and it's, it's probably one of the more difficult things to do is to get up and move, but it has a very big impact on blood sugar levels. Uh, physical activity and emergencies. Now, depending on the nature of the disaster that you're working with with people, there might be a change in regular activity. Increase in activity could be due to repairing damage or depending on the situation that people are in, if they're getting out and trying to remove the trees from their home or trying to um, get the water out of their basement or hauling waterlogged furniture out to the curb, that is an increased level of activity and that can actually have an effect of lowering your blood sugar. If you're increasing your activity but not increasing your food, you could lower your blood sugar level, and that could lead to a hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. On the same token, decreasing activity due to being away from your normal routine, you're not able to get up and move. You're not in your home. You're not able to be out trying to do things to get back into, um, into your routine can cause hyperglycemia or high blood sugar levels. Now, the other thing that we want to look, about, look at when people are in emergency situations regarding diabetes and exercise is that if your blood sugar levels are higher than 250 milligrams per deciliter, or higher than 250, activity can actually raise the blood sugar from there, even though we say that it has a lowering effect. At that point, there's going to be some other hormones and some other um, things that are going to kick in that can actually raise the blood sugar up. So if somebody's blood sugar is above 250, then we want to be careful with exercise because we don't want to do anything to raise it up any more than it is. That's why the next thing that we're going to talk about is so important, and that's checking blood sugar levels. Checking your blood sugar or your blood glucose. We use glucose and blood sugar interchangeably. But um, checking your blood sugar tells you what your blood sugar level is right now, and that allows somebody to make changes in how they're managing their diabetes. It allows them to know how stress might be affecting your blood sugar, how activity, how food, how medication might be affecting your blood sugar level. So um, it's a very important tool to use and learn how to use and learn how to use well. I want to show you some pictures here on the next slide of glucose, blood glucose monitors and test strips so that you can see what blood glucose monitors look like for those of you that haven't come across them in the past. They come in all different shapes and sizes. They're about the size of a cell phone, sometimes a little bit smaller than that. Some of them fit very neatly into the palm of your hand. Um, they come in different shapes and sizes and colors. But essentially, they all do the same function of we insert a test strip into the machine that usually turns the machine on. We then apply a sample of blood to the end of the test strip. And within a few seconds, about five seconds or less usually, it gives us a number on the screen 
that tells us what our blood sugar level is right now. Now, down in the far corner by the dime, you're going to see pictures of different strips that go into the machines. And the strips are what you put the sample of blood on into the machine, and that gives you a reading of what your blood sugar level is. You'll notice that the strips come in all different shapes and sizes also, just like the meters. Strips are not interchangeable with meters. Each meter has its own test strip. So you have to make sure that you're buying the strip that fits your meter. Sometimes within families of meters, like LifeScan, for instance, who makes the meters up at the top, the pretty colored ones, they have a strip that fits into several of their different meters. But by and large, you have to get the strip that matches the meter or else they won't work. Just that simple. Have in your packet of information a flow sheet that talks about blood glucose monitoring. So let's look at that. Now this, is, um, this flow sheet is what to do if someone has diabetes in regards to their testing supplies. Now for those of you that have worked with people that have diabetes, if they've come into your shelter, do they usually come in with a meter and their supplies? What is your experience with that? So your experience is that people come to you empty-handed. Is that yours, too? Actually, it's uh, very gender. Usually women that come with purses usually have their tests getting in. So it just depends. And my experience is that most of them, and most of them are women, um, come out of the house without anything at all. And no meters, no, no nothing. So let's go through this flow sheet here. If someone comes to you with diabetes in your shelter or wherever you are helping people in their emergency, um, a good, pr good first question is to ask off the top, do you have diabetes? If you don't have diabetes, then, you know, we don't need to use this sheet anymore. But if you have diabetes, then we want to ask people, are they testing their blood sugar? Not everybody tests their blood sugar. People with diabetes should be testing their blood sugar, but not everybody does test their blood sugar. So ask, are you testing your blood sugar? If they're not, okay. If they are, then do you have your meter with you and your supplies with you? If they don't have their supplies with you, then you need to assist them in, a, in obtaining those supplies. Now, many people are going to run out of the house, and I guess it depends on the nature of the emergency. If your house is on fire, then you're going to just take off. But if you don't have power because a tree fell on the power lines and you have to leave your house, doesn't mean that you're going to leave with your supplies. You may or may not have them. So if somebody um, is testing but didn't bring their supplies, then it's a good idea to assist them in obtaining some supplies, um, whether they can go back home and get them or whether you need to get them for um, that person from some other resource. It's a good idea to be testing during emergencies just for the reasons I said earlier, that blood sugars can go all over the place if activity levels change. If a person is under a lot of stress, blood sugars can go all over the place. They usually go up. So we want to be checking. Um, if they have their meter with them, do you have the supplies that you need? If they do, you're home free. If they don't, then you need to assist them in obtaining those supplies. And the type of supplies that people need for testing their blood sugar is the meter, is the test strips that match their meter, a lancing device, which is kind of like a pen that you put the lancet in that pricks your finger to get the drop of blood. So you need to have those things. Soap and water is a good thing for people that are testing because you want, you're puncturing the skin, so you want that to be clean. If a person can't get to soap and water, then alcohol is good. Um, you don't have to use alcohol as long as you can get to soap and water and wash your hands well. You also want to have some type of a sharps container so that that lancet that people use to prick their finger to get that drop of blood can be put safely into a container so that nobody else is pricked. You can use the red biohazard pack um, containers that you can get. A lot of them are a lot bigger. And I imagine you would have something like that at a emergency site. Yes or no? No. No? Okay. Then maybe you use a bleach bottle or a laundry detergent bottle or a heavy plastic bottle. Um, the co coffee comes in the heavy plastic bottles now or a coffee can. Something like that that is heavy and has a lid in it, on it. You can put the lancets in that, the, um, the strips, the alcohol swabs or cotton balls or whatever can go into the trash. But you want those to be contained in something that is going to keep them safe, that isn't going to squish when it gets sat on or dumped over or something like that. Something that's going to be a little bit sturdy. Um, those are some supplies that you need and you should have for people with diabetes when they're in the emergency um, shelters. 
Now, if somebody comes to you without testing supplies, do you have the ability to go and get them? Do you have funds to go and purchase them? How does that work for you? Uh, if you, uh, I'm going back to the units that you test the blood with. Uh huh. Four different ones out there. The person is using, we'll say, type A. He comes into a shelter. You don't have type A, but you've got type B with the strips. Are you going to get the same reading as as uh, as he would? Yeah. If you have strips and um, if you have the blood glucose testing supplies at the shelter and somebody comes in without them, yes, they can use those. That will be fine. That will, as long as you're using the equipment properly, it will give a good reading. It will give you the same reading as he would with his own. You're not going to get the same numbers, no, but it will give you a good reading. So you are, you are comfortable in using that. If you are using that on multiple people, though, you have to be very careful about the Lancet that you use in the lancing pen. Ideally, you should be using a single-use lancet that, that can only prick one person and then doesn't work anymore. If you use the traditional lancet that you insert, the kind that you would get with a kit that you purchase for your own use, for example, that little pricker can be used as many times as you want. So if you're in a situation where you have the equipment at a site and you have that type of a lancet, you're at risk for pricking somebody multiple times or pricking multiple people. So you really have got to be very, very careful with that. Are you talking of a situation where those supplies come with you to the emergency situation or you just happen to have one? I mean, with the question that you asked. Is that been a situation you've been in before? I'm just curious. Okay. Okay. The shelter, and it was the same type that that person was using at the house. Yeah, yeah. You could still use it. You could get the readings out of it, but you really have to be careful to make sure that the lancet that you're using inside is changed after every use. Um, you have to make sure that that lancing pen is cleaned, and I would clean that with alcohol. The, the testing meter, usually because of the way they are designed now, you don't get blood on the meter, but that could really be kind of a sticky wicket. I wouldn't go that path unless you absolutely had to because there's so many points along the way where you could um, cross-contaminate something. I'd be careful of that. If you're here in the Cleveland area, you can call our office and we can help you with emergency testing supplies, with a meter and strips and lancets and everything you need to test somebody's blood sugar. If somebody, let's say, was in a fire situation where they lost things in their home or they couldn't get back into their home, we can help those people with a supply. Um, the problem is they would have to come to our office to pick it up, but we could make some arrangements. So um, we have information in the green folder about our patient assistance program for blood glucose testing supplies. You could also go to Walmart or, and this is not just in the Cleveland area, but across the, the country. You could go to Walmart or Target or Walgreens or any big drugstore or box chain store um, location and get their house brand meter. For instance, Target has a house brand blood glucose meter called Up and Up. It goes for about, sells for about $10. A vial of 25 Up and Up test strips that fit that meter costs about $9. The meter comes with a lancet, with some lancets and a lancing pen. So you have a kit for about $18 or under $20 that is going to give you at least 10 tests for somebody. So you could go and purchase something like that, or you could go and get something like that if you needed it for an emergency situation. Again, if you find yourself in that situation here in the Cleveland area, call our office and let's see what we can do to help you out. Do you, do you yes. offer more than Cuyahoga County? Um, yes, we do offer Cuyahoga County or Lorraine, the surrounding counties, Northeast Ohio area. But again, um, we'd have to make arrangements for you somehow to come to the office and pick those up or some volunteer to come and pick those up. But give us a call and let's see what we can do to help you. Um, always use us as a resource. Now, when we talk about diabetes medications, um, we said earlier that depending on the type of diabetes you have, you may or may not need to take me medication. People with type 1 diabetes are going to take insulin. People with type 2 diabetes may take insulin or they may take the pills, and the pills are not insulin. That's another mechanism to control or help control blood sugars. You cannot take insulin by pill. Once it got down into the, into the stomach, it would be um, digested and destroyed. 
So you can't take insulin by pill. Those pills are another mechanism to help control your blood sugar level. There are so many different types of diabetes medications available now that it's pretty individualized. What this one is taking might not be what that one is taking. So it's pretty individualized in that way. And um, just because somebody is taking insulin doesn't mean that their diabetes is worse off than somebody else. Or just because somebody is taking more than one oral medication doesn't mean your diabetes is worse than somebody else. It means that this is the best way to manage your blood sugar levels. Okay, in emergency situations. Now, you have another flow sheet in front of you, and, and this one is uh, medications, how to help somebody with diabetes. Again, these are some of the things we need to keep in mind when um, somebody comes to you with diabetes and is taking medications. We need to ask them first, do you have diabetes? If you do, are you taking medications to help control your diabetes? If somebody is not, then we're okay. If somebody is, then we need to ask, are you taking insulin or are you taking oral medications to help manage your blood sugar level? And then what is the name of the medication you're taking? If you look on the back of this flow chart, these are just some of the medications. This is not a complete list. These are some of the medications that people with diabetes may be taking. The pills are at the top and insulins are at the bottom. Don't assume that somebody knows the name of the medication. They may know that name. They may have it written down in their wallet. They probably don't. So don't assume. Um, you need to make sure, especially if somebody comes to you without any medication and you need to help them get some new medication, you have to make sure that they know what kind of pills that they're taking, what the names are. If you look on the back, you can see that one medication, glimipiride, sounds a lot like gliburide. And if I said, are you taking gliburide or glimipiride? Or I might say gliburide, and you say, yeah, I'm taking that one, because it sounds so much like glipizide. So we've got three medications that all do something a little different that all sound the same. Maybe somebody's taking metformin. Are you taking metformin? No, I'm taking glucophage. Well, metformin and glucophage are the same medication. One's a generic name and one's a brand name. So um, you, need to, you need to know and you need to find out what kind of medications that somebody's taking. Again, when somebody is taking insulin, they, um, or when you're taking oral medications, if they come to you with, the, 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 with their pills, the oral medications don't need any special kind of storage. But if they're coming to you with insulin, or another injectable medication. There are a couple of other medications um, for, insul for diabetes that are injectable but are not insulin. If they're coming to you with insulin or an injectable medication, then it may need some special storage, and it might need some special equipment. You can't take insulin in your mouth. You have to have a syringe, or it's, you're using an insulin pen, or you're using um, an insulin pump. And all of those, um, the insulin pens and the insulin pumps have their own set of supplies that people need in order to get that insulin into their body. Alcohol swabs are necessary here. Sharp containers are necessary here also. So these are some of the basic things that you need to help people with their medications in emergency situations. But the flow chart that we have here, again, you ask if somebody has diabetes, are you taking medication? If you are, are you taking oral? Or are you taking insulin? And then what's the name of that? If they have the medications with them, that's great. If they don't and you need to help them get it, if they aren't dead on sure of what they're taking, you need to contact the physician or maybe the pharmacy that they get their medications from, if it's a local pharmacy, so that you can make sure you're getting the right name of the medications. Because as you saw, there are so many different types of medications and so many of them sound alike. We want to make sure that somebody is getting glipizide if they're taking glipizide. Then we need to ask, does that medication need to be refrigerated? Pills don't. You're fine with that. But insulin does need to be refrigerated depending on the, the kind of insulin that you're taking or the, the way that it's packaged. Insulin needs to be refrigerated if it is unopened. But once you open it and start using it, then it can be kept at room temperature. So we might need to have some refrigeration space for people that are taking insulin. Um, we don't ever want to freeze insulin. We don't want to get it too cold. So keeping it in an ice chest is not the best idea because it can get too cold and then it will destroy the insulin. So we have to be careful about that. And then again, do you have the supplies you need to take your insulin? It's all well and good to have an insulin pen with you, 
but if it, you don't have the pen needles to get the insulin in you, then we've got some issues. And those things are all prescription. Insulin um, pen needles, insulin syringes, um, insulin pump supplies are all prescription. So I can't help you with any of that. You need to go through the pharmacy, through a, um, a pharmacist, through a physician, through a, um, somebody that can write prescriptions for those things. Um, in terms of fast-acting insulin, which is more expensive, is that easily available for emergency supplies or is it required? It, fast-acting insulins are a prescription. You, it's not an over-the-counter, so you need to have that prescription. And, yeah, you can get it wherever because it is kind of the method of choice for people that are taking insulin, a long-acting insulin and then fast-acting insulins at each meal. So, yes, they are readily available at all pharmacies, but you've got to have a prescription. The older insulins used to, and I, I believe they still are, something that you could buy over-the-counter, but the newer insulins are prescription, and so you can't. You need to have that prescription. You need to have that sharps container also for people that are taking insulin so that you can deposit um, the needles and the syringes and things in a safe manner. The older types of insulin are over-the-counter? The older types of insulin were over-the-counter. Um, it was something that you could purchase over-the-counter. You didn't need a prescription. I don't mean to say that they were on a shelf like cough and cold medicine, but those were things that you did not need a prescription for, like regular insulin or NPH insulin. Those were non-prescription. You could go into the pharmacist and buy that. But we, we still use some of those insulins now, but the newer insulins work better. So if somebody were to go and to use some of those older insulins, they work totally different. You wouldn't take them the, way, the same way you would take newer insulins. They have totally different action times, peak times, totally different. So it's, it's a different ballgame there. Um, now, this is a picture of insulin pumps and insulin pens. Just so you have an idea of what some of this stuff looks like. An insulin pump, these are the ones here on, uh, on the left side of the screen. An insulin pump is about the size of a cell phone. A little bit more bulky, but about the size of a cell phone. And what happens is that the insulin is in a cartridge inside of the pump, and it gets into your body through a, um, a plastic tubing that is inserted underneath the skin. So somebody might wear um, their insulin pump on their jeans or on their pants, just like maybe you would wear a cell phone if you were holding a, or carrying a cell phone that way. Or you could have it in your pocket with the tubing coming out. Insulin pumps are a really good way to manage your blood sugar level, but a lot of times people think that it's kind of the brains and does all the work and takes all the thinking away from you, and that's um, the furthest thing from the truth. You have to be very knowledgeable about diabetes and about how your body reacts to different things in order to use an insulin pump well because you're actually pressing some buttons and putting in the right amount of insulin to match the food that you're eating or the exercise or activity level that you're taking out. So it, it's not um, something that does all the thinking for you. The insulin pens on the far side um, look like a fat fountain pen, and inside of that insulin pen is a cartridge of insulin. You put the cartridge in, you put a special pen needle at the top, you turn the bottom of the pen to the number of units of insulin you need, and you actually hear a clicking sound for every unit or half unit. And that makes this a very good mechanism of giving insulin to somebody who is visually impaired because they can hear the clicks and draw up their own insulin that way. But you draw up the amount of insulin you need, and then you give yourself insulin. And it, you don't need the vial and the syringe. It's just another neat way of doing it. So these are kind of what they look like. Uh, again, there's different products that have come out, so they, they change in their appearance a little bit. But generally, this is what they look like. And um, these are just ways, different ways of giving insulin to somebody with diabetes. The insulin pump is about five dollars $6,000. They're not inexpensive at all. The syringes or the um, insulin pens are comparable in price to insulin um, syringes and a vial of insulin. But the pump, uh, um, it's pretty expensive, and it has some of its own paraphernalia that goes along with it. But it does a great job at helping to manage blood sugar levels. Stress and diabetes is what we're going to look at now. Stress can make blood sugar levels go up. So if somebody is coming to you in an emergency situation and they have diabetes, it's not going to be uncommon for them to have elevated blood sugar levels. Now, you have to find out and make sure that they're taking their medication and they're eating properly, but 
being under that kind of stress can affect your blood sugar. It usually goes up high. Sometimes it goes low, but by and large, it's going to be elevated. Coping skills might not be what is needed for the situation, and that's certainly understandable. If people aren't sleeping as well or as much, that can have an effect on blood sugar levels also. Just the worry that people go through about their property, their home, their, um, you know, where am I going to go? How long can I stay here at this shelter? Where am I going to go after I go here? What, how am I going to get the things that I need? Um, can all really weigh down on a person, as I'm sure you can tell me that more than any, anybody else. Also, that change in priorities, going into a survival mode can be very hard on blood sugar levels. It can really have a big effect there. So for people with diabetes, this is another good reason why we want to be checking blood sugar levels. We don't want that blood glucose monitoring to be put by the side. We need it now more than ever so that we can monitor blood sugar levels, make adjustments in treatments, make sure that people are getting enough uh, medication, make sure that people are eating in a way that can help to manage their blood sugar level. If somebody's blood sugar level is riding high, then we want to make sure that we're giving them sugar-free beverages to keep it or to help to keep them from becoming dehydrated. If somebody is going through these stresses with coping skills and in and, and worry and, and loss and fear and frustration, having a counselor or somebody to speak to them to help them deal with it as best they can would be probably very helpful if somebody is open to that. Let's talk a little bit about hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Okay, hypoglycemia is defined as blood sugars of 70 or less. The general feeling that somebody has with low blood sugar is maybe feeling very weak or tired, not having a lot of energy, being very hungry. Your body is, is being starved for, for um, energy, a source of energy. You might feel a little bit shaky or sweaty, have chills, uh, maybe just feeling anxious, not your normal pleasant self, a little bit shaky, sometimes confused if blood sugar is too low. You might feel dizzy or headaches or um, just like your heart is pounding. Sometimes people feel a numbness, numbness or tingling around their mouth. Their vision might change a little bit. If the blood sugar gets very low, somebody could pass out or go into a seizure. Symptoms of low blood sugar can be very specific from person to person also, especially somebody that has diabetes for a while. Um, a symptom that you have might not be a symptom that somebody else has. So, again, that's probably something good to ask when somebody comes into you. Do you have diabetes? Do you have issues with low blood sugar? Not everybody with diabetes is going to have problems with low blood sugar, uh, but it's a good question to ask. And then if they do, well, what are your symptoms for low blood sugar? And kind of make note of that. People that are going to have uh, trouble with low blood sugar are folks that are taking insulin. That's going to be a short-term complication of, of taking insulin is low blood sugar. Some of the oral medications, if they make your body produce more insulin, then you may have an issue with low blood sugar. So, again, not everybody that comes to you with diabetes is going to have problems with low blood sugar. Um, other things that can affect low blood sugar or can cause low blood sugar is having had too much to drink or maybe having um, unplanned or increased physical activity. So if somebody is trying to clean their house out, trying to get the furniture out on the front por or front lawn, trying to fix things, that unplanned activity could actually cause a low blood sugar reaction. Taking too much diabetes medication, insulin or pills, can also cause um, low blood sugar. That stress factor can cause low blood sugar. Now, how do we treat somebody with low blood sugar? We follow the rule of 15. 15 grams of a quick-acting carbohydrate, and we wait 15 minutes. Blood sugar should rise anywhere from 35 to 50 points, depending on that particular individual. But 15 grams of quick-acting carbohydrate, wait 15 minutes, test the blood sugar. If the blood sugar is still below 70, then we want to repeat that process. It's a good idea to test somebody's blood sugar if they're complaining of symptoms of low blood sugar so that you know what you're working with because symptoms of high blood sugar can also mimic symptoms of low blood sugar. When your blood sugar is high, you might not see quite as clearly. You might be anxious or surly or not feeling very good. You may be very hungry you may have some of the same symptoms. So it's a good idea to test so you know what you're dealing with. But if you can't test, then err on the side of caution and treat it like it is a low blood sugar reaction. 
So you might be thinking, what is in grams of carbohydrate? What is all that about? A half a cup of juice is about 15 grams of carbohydrate. It can be any kind of juice, apple juice, orange juice, doesn't matter. You don't need to put sugar in juice. That's kind of an old wives' tale. There's enough carbohydrate in that half a cup of juice to raise up that blood sugar. You don't need to add anything else. Um, glucose tablets. Have any of you seen those before? It's like a big sweet tart. It dissolves very quickly in your mouth. Those have three to four grams of carbohydrate in each one. So three to four glucose tabs that you can get at any drugstore, any pharmacy. Jelly. A couple of teaspoons of jelly or jam. Um, a tablespoon of honey. Um, six to eight lifesaver type candies. You've got to chew them up, though. You can't suck on them. You've got to chew them up and get them down. Even taking a tablespoon of sugar and dissolving it into a little bit of water and drinking that down can be very effective in raising somebody's blood sugar level. A half a cup of regular soda pop will work also. Regular soda pop. Sugar-free pop is not going to help you. You want to get the sugar that comes, or the carbohydrates in it that comes from the sugar. So sugar-free pop will not help you here. A half a cup of regular pop. Sometimes people will eat chocolate or you'll give somebody chocolate. If that's all you have, that's fine. But chocolate has fat in it, and it's got a little protein in it. So that rise in blood sugar isn't going to be as quick as you want it to be. Not nearly as quick as it would be with a half a cup of juice or the glucose tip. So chocolate isn't always the best, but if it's all you have, that's fine. Um, sometimes people will drink milk. And again, we've got the same situation. Milk has protein in it, and it may or may not have fat in it, but that's going to slow down the rise in blood sugar. If it's all you have, fine, but um, it's not the best if you have something like this. Um, even a tablespoon of honey. Anything that's sweet like that is fine. Have you Now, what did you say that you had? You had sugar cubes? And what else did you have? You had juice? Okay. And you can buy packets of like an oral glucose. One tube of it has about 15 grams of carbohydrates. And you could squirt that in somebody's mouth. If they're having trouble swallowing, you could squirt it into somebody's mouth and massage their cheek, and that will help in the swallowing process. The tubes of frosting, again, that's kind of like the, the chocolate because there's fat in there and maybe a little bit of protein. It could slow down the rise in blood sugar. If it's all you got, that's fine. But some of these others might be like a liquid glucose or a glucose tab might be better. But again, if it's all you have, then go ahead and want to get it in. That's the whole point. Um, low blood sugar, can, it can drop quick. You need to treat it. It won't just kind of wait around for you to get around to treating it. You've got to treat it quick. So you want to get something in there. And again, watch the clock. If um, after 15 minutes, check again to see what blood sugar levels are. It should rise. If that person isn't going to have something to eat, Within a half hour, then you need to get them some food, um, some type of a snack like we talked about earlier. Any one of those snacks would be fine so that the blood sugar doesn't dip down again. Um, if they're going to be eating within a half hour, you're probably okay. Okay, other things that you need to consider for people that have diabetes in emergency situations. Problems with your feet. People with diabetes oftentimes have problems with circulation. So the blood isn't flowing as well or as easily through the body especially in the extremities, the hands and feet, tend to see it more in the feet and legs. So if the blood isn't circulating as well and you're not getting oxygen down to areas of your feet that might have a cut or a scrape or something, it's not going to heal as quickly. So think about the emergency situations that you're working with. If somebody's running from their home and has no shoes on their feet, you need to make sure that that's taken care of. Check people's feet. Make sure that there aren't any open cuts or wounds. An open cut or wound can get bad fast for somebody with diabetes. And once an infection gets in, it's going to be difficult to, um, to get rid of. Oftentimes for people with diabetes, if you have an infection from, let's say, um, you, go out and you buy a new pair of shoes and you just can't wait to put them on, and you put them on and you go, and then you have um, a scrape on your heel, let's say. If that gets infected, it can take a lot longer to heal than somebody who doesn't have diabetes. And we don't want to get in that situation. We want to keep feet clean and dry. So that's something that we need to look out for. Look out for people that have other health conditions like heart disease or high blood pressure. Diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure tend to run in the same pack. If you have one, you're probably going to have one or both of the others. So people might be taking multiple types of medication, not just for diabetes, but for heart disease and for um, high blood pressure 
or if they have trouble with um, feeling sensations in their feet, perhaps, um, neuropathy, then maybe they're taking medications for that. People with diabetes are more likely to develop depression at some point in their life with diabetes, so maybe there's antidepressants involved there could be other types of medications involved. So we need to make sure that we look for that also. Vision is something that can affect people with diabetes. You might not be seeing quite as well, or the diabetes has affected your blood sugar, something called um, retinopathy, among other things. So that's something to look at, too. Maybe people aren't moving as well. Um, They need to have clear paths. Maybe um, they aren't traveling at night because they don't feel comfortable driving when the sun goes down. So there's some things to look at. People with diabetes, uh, although we don't see it as often, but it is something that we need to look out for, um, people using prosthetics or people on dialysis. These are um, long-term complications for some people with diabetes. So we need to make sure that we're um, looking out to see if somebody has any type of prosthetic device or if somebody is on dialysis. You have some stories about what happened with you and people in your building on, well, not dialysis, but on oxygen. So um, those are all some things that we have to look out for for people with diabetes. And I think if you look on the Cuyahoga County Board of Public Health website, I do remember seeing a PowerPoint for people in emergency situations who, use, who have, have prosthetic devices or are on dialysis. So I know that there are some recommendations out there that go much further beyond what I've talked about. When to call for help for people with diabetes. Um, When to refer people to a hospital, a clinic, or an ER. If they have low blood sugar or hypoglycemia that is not responding to treatment, call ER, call EMS, just just do it. If people have blood glucose readings that are consistently higher than normal, and a normal blood sugar for people, a normal blood sugar for people that do not have diabetes is anything, a fasting blood sugar of 99 or less. For people that have diabetes, um, we have different guidelines that we follow depending on when a person has eaten and when we're testing their blood sugar. But if somebody has a blood sugar of over 180, generally speaking, um, after they've hit, two hours after they've eaten, we need to start watching for that. So if people's blood sugars are running 250s or above for a couple of consecutive readings, then we might need to be looking at getting additional care for that person. If somebody has blood sugars of 250 or greater and they're experiencing some other symptoms like vomiting or trouble breathing, rapid breathing, um, a fruity smell to their breath, um, belly aches, it's time to call. There are other things that might be going on. So it's time to call EMS and get them into a situation where they can be taken care of. Now, some of the nitty-gritty of disaster situations. Now, I know with Hurricane Sandy last year, I'll tell you what I did last year. Um, I facilitate several empowerment groups or support groups for people with diabetes across the city. No, it was in September. For all of my different empowerment groups, our topic was being prepared. We were being prepared for sick days because we know when the weather changes and the winter comes, you're going to catch a cold, you might get the flu, you get sniffles, sore throats. So we talked about being prepared, having everything that you needed in one place to take care of yourself. We talked about being prepared for low blood sugar reactions so that when you go out to a meeting like this, do you have your meter with you? Do you have a source of food with you? Do you have glucose tabs or something to help you with a low blood sugar reaction? And then we talked about being prepared for exercise and activity when you've got two feet of snow outside or it's just too cold and you don't feel like going to the rec center. How do you keep up with your activity? So we talked about this in all of our groups. And at the end of the groups, when the ladies or when folks did the evaluations, they said, um, you know, I said, well, what are you going to change here based on what you learned? Is there anything you're going to do? Well, we're going to go, we're going to put together these sick day boxes, Marianne, because I had one there and I showed them all the things you need to take care of yourself if you get sick, different types of food, having your medication, having extra testing supplies, um, having the names of your doctors at hand with the phone numbers, having the name of your pharmacy with the phone number at hand, so that if somebody else has to come in and take care of you, all of this is in one place. Okay, they're going to go home and do this. October meeting came, and I said, how many of you made your sick boxes? Because that's what several of you said you were going to do. How many of you did that? And there was a spattering of hands at each meeting, maybe two or three. I'm like, okay, keep this in mind, because things happen. It doesn't always happen to the next person. And then comes the end of October when Sandy comes around. 
I was without power for seven days. I was the last house in Fairview Park to be turned on. The ladies came, you know, my one group, of, uh, which is just ladies, our divas, came together, and I said, anybody without power? Oh, yeah, a day here, two days there. I guess there will be five days, or, I mean seven days of no power. And I said, but I got a, a, a call from one of you, and she wasn't there that day, but she gave me permission to talk. She lived in Rocky River and was without power for five days. She was in a situation where she was she knew she was going to be losing her job. So while she while she had health insurance, she was stockpiling her insulin. And she had a huge supply of insulin in her refrigerator. And the storm came and the power went dead and she had no power for 5 days. And all of this insulin in her refrigerator, she was panicked. What am I going to do? She was going to put it on ice. Well, she called us, what do I do? What do I do? So we were able to talk her through it. No, do not put it on ice, because if you put it on ice, it's going to freeze, and then you're going to lose it all. Do you have a thermometer in your refrigerator? No, my refrigerator has an electronic thermometer, but your refrigerator is not working, isn't it? Is it? She says, no, I would say, we don't know what the temperature of your refrigerator is. So she went out and got a, a thermometer and put it in the refrigerator. We said, just keep it in there, don't open the refrigerator. She put the thermometer in there and was able to watch the temperature on that. And when it dropped to a level that was no longer a good place to keep her insulin, put the thermometer in the freezer because the freezer stays colder longer than the refrigerator. So that was at the right temperature. She moved her insulin into the freezer where it didn't freeze. And then when that dropped, she got it over to a neighbor's house who got who had their power on. So we were able to maneuver her that way. But Again, it goes back to not being prepared. How many of you have a thermometer in your refrigerator that isn't the electronic kind? From a food safety standpoint, that would have been helpful too. For someone else, we were able to get their insulin out into their garage. They had an attached garage that stayed a little bit, um, didn't get as cold, so we could move things outside. But again, it's about thinking, thinking ahead, because things do happen. So that's how we were able to kind of talk somebody through it. But, um, when you're working with folks that have diabetes, keep in mind that um, they need to be able to store their medication if they're taking insulin. They need to be able to store that medication someplace. And we don't want to put it on ice because we'll ruin it. But we need to keep it cold. The temperature that you need to keep it between is um, listed on the packages that the um, insulin comes in or the insulin pen comes in. So it's right there we need to be able to keep that in the right temperature zone. So transferring it from place, cold place to cold place. You don't put it on the ice, but put it up above so that there's something between it so that it doesn't freeze. That would be, and then you have that thermometer inside and you keep checking the temperatures. I think it's between 36 and 46 degrees is where you want to um, keep it. Any higher or any lower and you could destroy the insulin. It's also a good idea to know what insulin looks like. If it has some insulin, it's cloudy. Some insulin is clear. So you have to know what your insulin is supposed to look like. If cloudy insulin looks clear, we got a problem. If clear insulin looks cloudy, we got a problem. If there's any crystals or any clumping, it needs to get tossed out. It can't be used effectively any longer. But you did the right thing. You know, I would have suggested putting ice down and then a container over it to keep the cool and then the packages around it like you did. Continuous, continuous blood glucose monitoring is a device that a person can wear or that can, can use that checks their blood sugar levels many, many times during the course of the day. It's available. We don't see a whole lot of it. It's not absolutely necessary. Um, it's a really nice tool for people to use if there's any kind of an issue where they're trying to get their blood sugar stabilized. People using continuous blood glucose monitoring still need to be checking their blood sugar levels. Um, they need to have access to a meter so that they can help calibrate that. But if that were to not be able to be used, you could still check blood sugars using blood glucose monitors. Um, that people have or that you could purchase at a store. Okay, I think in just summing it up then, when it comes to um, taking care of somebody with diabetes in an emergency situation, talk to them and find out what they need. Are you taking medications? Do you have it with you? Do you need us to help you get it? Are you testing your blood sugar? Do you have your equipment with you? Do you need us to get it for you? And then there are low-cost places where you can go and buy what you need for somebody. Um, or if you're in the Cleveland, greater Cleveland area, call us. 
use us as a reference. Give us a call and we can try to help you um, with whatever your needs are or walk you through whatever your situation is. Find out what kind of medication, if it's insulin and it needs to be stored in a refrigerator or in a cool place, do you have that place available to you? If not, work on somehow getting it for them. But ask somebody what they need. Ask somebody, do you have problems with low blood sugar? Again, not everybody is going to. But if they say, yes, I do sometimes have low blood sugar, what are your symptoms? Symptoms can be different from person to person. Um, some people also have a condition called hypoglycemic unawareness. And that means that they don't feel low blood sugars that come on. They may have had diabetes for so long that they just don't feel the symptoms any longer. So um, that doesn't happen all the time, but it's a possibility also. But talking to somebody and asking them what their needs are is probably your best bet and the best first place to start.